Before we get into our study for tonight, which is a follow-up of this morning, I want to read a passage of Scripture, just uh, one verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. I think this is a chap- one of the chapters in the Bible, really chapter 11 through 14 of 1 Corinthians, that tell us more about what God wants to happen in worship, and I'm talking mostly about attitude than anywhere in the New Testament. And specifically, it says here in verse 26, He says, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, like we're doing right now, each one of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. And the reason I point that scripture out is because what he is advocating to that first century church is, you know, when you come together like this, What's supposed to happen is not observation. What's supposed to happen is participation. That's what worship is. Remember, we use the term worship kind of wrongly a lot of times. We use a lot of Bible words and phrases, probably not in the way they should be used. But we talk about going to worship. We're using worship as a noun, like it's an event. And, oh, thank you. I don't want to step on my glasses. Uh, Worship is a verb. Worship is something we do. It it means to contribute to God. So with that in mind, we're going to have a discussion tonight. And it's meant we're having a discussion on purpose to give you, unlike you you weren't able to do it this morning. I guess you could. I wouldn't get mad at you if somebody raised their hand in the middle of the sermon. But that's just not our protocol, you know. I probably wouldn't be ready for that, but it probably wouldn't freak me out too bad. But that's just not our custom. But here, that's what we want. We want you to make comments. We want you, I'm going to have some questions that I've got prepared. And I want you to bring up some insights and maybe questions or points that I didn't think of from the sermon this morning. You know, one thing about any passage of Scripture, every week I leave out way more than I present. When you're studying stuff, you find all this stuff during the week, and you have pages and pages of notes. You're like, what's the hardest part of, sermon preparation for me is not finding something to say it's like what do I have to leave out and there's so much stuff so you can't say everything about a passage you're trying to go in one main direction so uh, let me ask you a question we're going to talk about the crucifixion as Paul said here in this great passage you know his whole life was he said I determined when I was with you I wasn't gonna know talk about anything except for Jesus and him crucified that's what his whole life was about and we talked about that this morning let me just ask you, when, when, would you, when do you think in your life that the crucifixion and what it was all about and the meaning of it, when did it begin to make sense to you? How old do you think it was or can you, do you remember a specific time when that started making sense to you? What it was all about? Okay, don't everybody talk at once. Pam's trying to think, okay, it's been a while, okay. grasp it more you've you know you've read the bible a lot more you see things you're able to connect the dots you might say some things you didn't see before okay anybody else and when we talk about you know when did the when did the meaning of jesus death make sense to you i think this is it's really important obviously because um The Bible doesn't say anywhere, here's how old you have to be before you can become a Christian. I wish it did. (laughs) I wish God would have said, okay, the second they turn, you know, whatever, 10, 14, 13, whatever it is. He didn't say that. So you have to, and different children mature at different ages and all that. But here's the thing about Scripture. I think there's an extreme on both ends, once again. I'm not for baptizing six-year-old kids which I've seen happen in our fellowship before. I'm not for that. I don't think, I mean, I, I, I know some kids are really smart. It's not just a matter of being smart. It's not just understanding what it says. Are you willing to commit your life to this? This is my personal pet peeve. 
Anybody who's raised kids, we only raised one, I understand. Some of you have raised a whole flock of them, and they're all different. I get that. But I know from personal experience from raising our daughter, when they are up until they are about 12, <laughs> things do start to change, especially when they, turn, when they turn a teenager. If it hadn't happened to you yet, trust me, <laughs> unless you have an incredibly unusual son or daughter, Things are going to change. And I don't mean it was horrible. Life wasn't horrible with our daughter in our house when she turned a teenager. But it is different. When, you're, when your kids are little, mommy and daddy, they want to be with mommy and daddy everywhere they go. And mommy and daddy are the greatest heroes in the world. And if you, they want to please their parents. That's why you have to watch out about them. I want to be baptized when I'm six. It might just be I want to do what I know what mommy and daddy want for me. And it's not really their choice. You see what I'm making, saying? Baptism has to be a choice that you make. I am choosing to follow Jesus. I'm choosing to make him the Lord of my life. I think that can be too young. And then I also think it can be, I've heard some people say, well, you have to know, you have to know all this stuff. No. When you read the New Testament, let me ask you a question. When you read the New Testament conversion stories in the book of Acts, which I think are very instructive, what does it look like people had to know before they became a Christian? Who Christ was. Uh, they had to know they're a sinner and that my sin separates me from God. Jesus is the only answer and I'm willing to repent and submit my life to Jesus. That's it. There weren't week-long, you know, month-long classes on every conceivable issue in the world. That can come later, but that's not what makes you a Christian. Like in the story of the Ethiopian conversion in chapter 8 of Acts, we know that one well. He didn't say, you know, he didn't teach him all this stuff about every conceivable issue. He taught him about Jesus. And when he understood about Jesus, that if he's not in a relationship with Jesus, he's separated from God, he says, where's water? <laughs> I'm ready to be baptized. It was real simple. So I think there's two extremes on that. Um, let me ask you a question. From the passage we looked at this morning, which is in Luke's Gospel, we're almost done with the Gospel of Luke. We've been looking at that this whole year, longest book in the New Testament. Uh, we focused on, you know, living your life like Jesus. Live like Jesus died. He was such an example. But were there some things from that passage, maybe something that I just prompted a thought when I was speaking this morning, or maybe something you were reading that I didn't project, or some other thought you had, you know, he could have said this point, this would have been a good point, and you're probably right. Any of those things from the passage you'd like to bring up today? About the crucifixion of Jesus, that whole the trials he went through, the abuse he went through, his love, mercy, grace, all those kind of things. Anything? Anything come up to anybody? Yes. Yeah. Once again, aren't you aren't you amazed at how Jesus handled everything? You know, I mentioned today. You know, he instead of living under the circumstances, he rose above the circumstances. Every one of us has probably been mocked and ridiculed and made fun of and felt left out from time to time. But that and the the physical abuse that was the worst form. You know, the word uh, uh, excruciating. Did you know that comes from the word for cross? That's where it comes from. Ex they made that word up after the cross, after uh, the Romans devised this means of execution. Ex it's excruciating. Has the word crucifix right in the middle of it. Just horrible. And to have that kind of composure to people who are doing this to you, we all know. Let's admit. I'll admit it. I'm the preacher, and I'll admit it. <laughs> when somebody does something bad to me, my first impulse is I'll get you back. 
Now, that's not right, but I'm just saying that's my, my fleshly impulse says that. And you probably all have, I'll show you. You know, uh, Ken led a song this morning. He could have called 10,000 angels. He certainly could have. And if it would have been me, I probably would have done it. You know, people who are, who are mocking you and jeering you and saying, hey, if you're the son of God, come down from there. I would have said, well, I'll show you, buddy. Boy, he had such composure. He didn't let other people control him at all. That's so hard to do, but he was a perfect model of it. Yes, Roy. No, that's bad. Yeah. 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 In fact, one of the slides I have a little bit later here tonight, I just have a few, but one of them is from the, one of the scourging scenes in Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. Have most of y'all seen that movie? Most of you? Brutal. Absolutely brutal. And uh, I remember uh, I was watching it. We lived in Oklahoma City at the time when it first came out in 2004, somewhere around in there. I think it's when it came out. Anyway, I went with some friends from church, Oklahoma City, and we're sitting there watching this, and I remember, you know, it was horrible. It's not a movie where you want to have a Coke and popcorn. It's not that kind of movie. But while we're watching it, there's some lady in the auditorium, while this was going on, cried out, Make them stop! Oh, it was, it was bad. That, that, unfortunately, that movie was very accurate. You know, that scourging with the... Uh, you know, metal jagged edges and bone just ripping the flesh off of your back, exposing your organs. I mean, it was that bad. It killed a lot of people. Uh, and for him, the whole time, to just take that and then to be marched through the streets and mocked and made fun of, and then when he's on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. My goodness. Right. And how, how do you explain that is, I don't know how all this works, of course, but I, I think it's kind of like this. Jesus was God the whole time he was on, on earth. Jesus was God down here walking around in the form of a human being. That's who Jesus was. He was God, but he was also a human being. It's kind of like this, but he chose to limit himself on purpose. It's kind of like, I know, you know, when, when uh, our daughter Tiffany was growing up, we had more, she loved to swim all the time. Loved it. She always wanted to have a race. She beat me every time, just barely by that much. And every time we would have races, Daddy, I want to race you. Okay, we'll race. I was an all-American 800-meter runner in college, okay? <laughs> she would always just barely out-touch me at the fence. You know what's going on there. She finally told me here not too long ago I know you were wet, letting me win all those races she didn't know it at the time but she said I, I can see what's going on but you don't want to smoke your daughter when you're they're you know eight years old or something right uh, that's what Jesus is doing he still has the full powers like I could have you know lapped her in race running especially maybe in swimming too but but you're limiting your you limit yourself you have the capacity I think that's kind of a pretty good analogy for what's going on with Jesus. He's God. He's fully God. But he's intentionally not utilizing everything that's available to him for the sake of, for the sake of us. Um, this scene right here is a scene of what? Jesus where? Exactly. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the night that he was, he's about to be betrayed by Judas just minutes right after this. They're going to come and they're going to arrest him. Right before this is when he introduced, you know, when they were taking the Passover meal and he gave new significance to that. He instituted the Lord's Supper and all that. Uh, and the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus was so intense during this. And the, the movie The Passion of the Christ, once again, does a really good job of showing how just the anxiety that he was under. It says that his sweat became like what? By, it became like drops of blood. That's an actual medical condition called hematidosis. And what it means, I had to look this up because I didn't know it. The capillaries dilate and they burst and it's caused 
and, and it mixes with your, bl your blood and sweat mixed together. It's caused by extreme duress. What we need to keep in mind is Jesus is a human being. He knows he's about to be crucified, and he knows what that's like. He knows this is horrible, and he's under extreme duress. And so let me ask you a question. Here's the question. What does this scene of Jesus in the garden say to you? Okay, all right. What else? What else does this say to you? Yeah. He's asking for strength. See, that's a good point that John made. There are times when you and I are going to face things. We can't do it by ourselves. We need to ask God for extra strength and special help to go through whatever particular situation. I doubt any of us will face anything like that. But we go through bad things down here, don't we? And we need, he's showing us an example that we need to reach out and to ask God. Uh, this reminds me of a passage. In fact, I want to read this one. It's not going to be on the screen. Turn to this one, Hebrews chapter 4. You all know this passage well, but it's good for us to be reminded of it. Hebrews chapter 4. This, uh, Hebrews is, is the book in the New Testament that probably does the best. It really exalts Jesus more than just about any other book. And the whole book is about Jesus. And in verse 15 of Hebrews 4 says, We do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, see, and so that we can receive mercy and grace in our time of need. What this is saying is, Jesus, and, and you know the Bible says in the book of Romans also, and I, I brought it up in a sermon a few weeks ago, did you know Jesus actually prays for us right now? That's what it says. He makes intercession for us. That means he prays for us right now. Jesus prays for you, and he knows what it's like to be you because he was one of us. He was down here walking around. It says, that verse in Hebrew says, he was tempted in every way you're tempted. You say, well, he wouldn't understand. Yeah, he does. In fact, he understands a lot more than we do, and here's why. Because when you and I are tempted, Satan doesn't have to use his whole arsenal on us. We usually give in, you know, way before he pulls out the big guns. With Jesus, he pulled out everything he could think of. He pulled out everything. He pulled out the atomic weapons. Nothing was working. He's been tempted far worse than any of us have, and yet didn't sin a single time. To me, which is the biggest miracle in the New Testament. I mean, I'm very impressed with Jesus' other miracles. Walking on the water, I'm impressed with that. Turning a little boy's lunch into enough to feed 5,000 people and have more left over than they started with. I'm real impressed with that. Raising people from the dead, I'm very impressed with that. But how about this? He's a human being, keep in mind. Never sinned in 33 years one time. How many of you think you can make the next 33 hours without doing it? <laughs> well, you're right. Roy's exactly getting out of this service without having a bad attitude or thinking something or, you know, will be hard. 33 years? Not one time? Wow. He understands, he can empathize with us, and he knows what we're going through, and he can pray for us and give us the grace that we need in, in time of need. Any other comments on what this scene in the garden says to us? What lessons we can learn from it? Yes, Carrie. doesn't record it.
No, exactly. Right. There's pain and probably the unknown of death. He's a human being. You, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody in here, you know, I've known people before say, I'm not afraid of death. And I'm not saying I'm scared to death of it. I know I'm in a relationship with Jesus, and I know I'm saved by Jesus. But at the same time, there's some trepidation there. I've never been there before. I've never been on death's doorstep. Or uh, I can imagine for anybody who is, and they know they're going to die. He know, that's what he knows is about to happen. That's got to affect your mind, and it did his, but he did it without sinning, which tells me that that anxiety and that kind of sense is not sin. So he, under, he understands us, which is, uh, I think, really important and helpful for all of us. Think about this scene. You know, we talked about this morning. Jesus is crucified. There's these two criminals. And remember... Uh, he tells this one thief. Remember both of them, Matthew chapter 27, verse 44, if you want to look it up. And there's also a verse in Mark chapter 15. Both of those passages say that both of these criminals, while Jesus is on the cross, Luke's gospel doesn't record it, but those do, they were deriding him and mocking him and making fun of him, along with the rest of the crowd. Both of them were. And then, of course, one of them had a change of heart. The other one didn't, but one of them saw how Jesus had such poise and was so composed and so full of grace, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And this one thief eventually said, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then, of course, Jesus said, you know, today you're going to be with me in paradise. So here is the question. What does this thief's redemption tell us? As long as we're alive, there's a chance. It's never too late. Jesus loves everybody, no matter how bad of a life you've lived, which this guy probably wasn't that good. He loves everybody. David, were you, were you saying something? There's always hope. Uh, you know, here's, what we, here's why I think this matters to us. I bet everybody in this room knows someone that you're very concerned about who is not a Christian and they seem to be very hard-headed, or they were once a Christian, and they've fallen away, and they're no longer responsive. And in your mind, you're thinking, there's just no hope. You all following me? I, don't, I just don't see any hope for those people. This says there's hope. The only person who is beyond hope is that second thief. Because that second thief never would acknowledge Jesus as, if he would have just done that, humbled himself and acknowledged, I need you, please remember me. He's the other one didn't do it. Anyone who is willing to do that, no matter how you, bad you've been, no matter how hard you've been, no matter how late in life it is, God will always forgive if we will do that. The only people who are beyond hope are those who won't submit to the Lord. Anybody who submits to the Lord in true, genuine repentance and faith and baptism, he will always forgive them. Yes, Roy. Yeah, in fact, there's a passage in Second Peter that says that, that we'll get to on Wednesday night, and that's pretty scary. People who embraced Jesus as their Lord and Savior and turned away, it says it would be better for them if they never knew the way of righteousness. That's pretty serious. Hey, real, real serious. Worse in what way? I don't know, but, boy, I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that. That, that should motivate us to, I know you can't make people, I understand that. There are people, if I could beat people over the head and make them believe, uh, there'd be a lot of people I'd be beating over the head. But you know that doesn't work. But prayer does work. Don't give up. Prayer softens people's hearts. You know, one of the things I love about, you know, when you read through the Bible every year, you see stuff. And I always see stuff every year that I didn't see before. One of my favorite books, and you're going to think, really? That's one of your favorite books? <laughs> you know what one of my favorite books is? is Second Chronicles. You're going to be like, you're kidding me. Because the first seven chapters is he begat and he begat. And you're like, oh, I'm never going to get through this. But after you get past the long lists of begattings, 
Here's what Second Chronicles is primarily about. It says all the time, God did this. God made this happen. He worked in this person's life. He changed this person's heart. God directly operates on people's hearts. I don't believe he's quit doing that. When you pray, I believe God directly intervenes in situations. Now, he doesn't always answer it the way you want it to. Like with Jesus praying in the garden, Father, if there's any other way for salvation to be accomplished, please do that. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. God answered his prayer. There was no other way. That was the answer. That wasn't maybe what Jesus wanted to hear, obviously, but, and same thing with us when we pray, it's not always answered the way we want, but God does hear our prayers. And prayer is powerful and effective. My point is, this, here's a hardened thief, criminal, horrible, that's just now, minutes before this, heaping abuse upon Jesus, and he has a change of heart. Don't give up on people in your life. There is, there is, uh, you know, it's never too late. You never know when people might change. And we, we've all been surprised before by people like, wow, never knew they would turn around. But sometimes, sometimes they do. What else does this story tell you? Anything else? But they they had fled. Matthew's gospel says the apostles had fled. They had, to, they had already headed to the hills. When they saw what was happening to Jesus, they said, we don't want any part of that. So yeah, they were gone. And that is a good point. No matter how bad the world gets today, and it, you know, I don't like the direction it's going, but uh, there still are good people with good hearts. Uh, you know, that's, that song we, uh, that uh, Clay led us in a second ago, these are the days of Elijah. One of, the, one of the little phrases in there says, the fields are as white in your world. You know what that means? What do you think it means? The fields are as white in your world. That's a, that's a metaphor of evangelism that Jesus talked about one time. The fields are white unto harvest. In your world right now, it might not look like it, but there are a lot of people who really are open to spiritual things. Don't be deceived into thinking that nobody cares about spiritual things. Oh, yes, they do. Now, they're confused, I'll admit that. But uh, there are people who are very, con very uh, they care very much about spiritual things. And so the fields are white for harvest. It doesn't all fall on bad ground. Carrie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He didn't he didn't bring that up at all, did he? You know, there's a verse in the Psalms and it said I don't remember exactly what passage it is, but here's what it says. It says, O Lord. If you took a record of sin, who could stand? I'd be, I'd be in bad shape. We all would. If you took a record of sin, if you made a record of sin, who could stand? Fortunately, he doesn't. And when he sees us, when we're in a relationship with Jesus, when we've submitted to him in, in baptism based on our faith and repentance, when we do that, it's, it's kind of like to use an analogy. If I had a marker board up here, 
Uh, we're going to fill that marker board up with sand, but he's going right behind us with a, an eraser, just erasing it. You know, that passage, First John 1, verse 7, if, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin is what the uh, would be a good translation of that verse. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, no, that's not the case. No, we we stand in a saved relationship with the Lord. It's kind of like, once again, to use an analogy, you know, there's extremes on that end. There's one extreme that says you can sin all you want to and God doesn't care and he's fine because you were baptized. Well, that's not true. He does care. <laughs> that's not true. He's sin serious to him. But then there's another extreme that says, you know, we're lost every time we're sin. Every time we sin. That's not true. You're still in a relationship with the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need to own up to it and repent. Yes, but you're not lost. It's kind of like this, to use an analogy. You know, my wife and I, uh, this, this summer, uh, we celebrated 30 years of marriage. We've been married for 30 years. Every time I have messed up, over 30 years, which has been quite a few, <laughs> you know, we haven't had in our relationship, fortunately, any bad catastrophic kind of situations. But there have been times I've done dumb things and said things I shouldn't have said that or shouldn't have acted this way. And she's done maybe a couple. I can't remember any of them. But I've done more than her. But she has never kicked me out of the house. And she might not have liked it. We might have had one of those evenings where it was kind of quiet. You know, we all had those maybe. <laughs> but we're still married. It's like that with God, I think. Okay, you're you're still in relationship with him, but you need to... Uh, you need to do better. You need to repent. So uh, this scene right here, the one on the left and the one on the right too, uh, you know, this is that uh, scene that we were talking about earlier, you know, this where they are giving Jesus the, the lashes, the scourging. Just look at that image for a second. Tell me what you see there. People laughing. And what does that what does that do to you on the inside? Jesus is being beaten almost to death. And people are mocking and laughing. Tell me what that makes you feel like. It makes me mad. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. When I was at that movie, I know it was a movie. But that guy who was playing that soldier right there, I wanted to strangle that guy. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was mad. Uh... Let me ask you a question. Son, the, here is Jesus, the Son of God. Now, I know they don't know this, but that's who he is. The Son of God, the Messiah, the hope of the world is right there in front of them. They're beating him to death. They're mocking. They're laughing. They're not counting this as anything serious at all. Here's what this says to me. To them, these Roman soldiers were professional killers. This is not their first crucifixion. They've done this before. They know how to inflict pain. It's just a job to them. They do it all the time. And whatever your job is, you may be really good at it, and you may really like it and all that, but if you're not careful, it can become kind of ho-hum and just routine. I think what's happened to them, this is just our job. It's just kind of ho-hum. It's kind of become routine. And it also shows you what's happening here just how absolutely hardened some people can get. And we, it can happen to us. As you all know, I have known people, and so have you, who have been real sold out, fired up, devoted followers of the Lord, and now they don't care at all. and just completely turned off and mock the name of Christ. We need to make sure, this is what the book of Hebrews is about, make sure that doesn't happen to you. You've got to be extra diligent. And then this scene over here, what's going on right here? Gambling for his clothes. His clothes are right here. Jesus is just right behind them over here somewhere. And these soldiers, here's the truth of what's going on. They're bored. They've done this many times. A guy's hanging on the cross. They don't think anything about it. and They're just involved in some trivial game. 
they've got some kind of makeshift dice they've got there and they're rolling and they're trying to figure out who's going to win his clothing. They're bored. They're caught up in these trivial pursuits. Tell me what that tells you about humanity. Here's what can happen, and it can, especially in the culture in which we live right now, the most important event in human history is taking place right where they're at. It's taking place right now when they are living. It hasn't taken place when we're living, or other, but it's taking place right in front of them, and they're right there. The most important thing that's ever happened in the history of the world, and they are totally oblivious to it. Instead, they're caught up in some trivial game of gambling for some guy's clothes. We're, well, we're going to get, don't steal my thunder. We're about to get to that. Okay. You're right. You're right, Scott. You're, you're right. You're right. We're, don't steal my thunder. Okay. You, you, you're anticipating a slide I'm about to show. But you're right. But most of them, which is actually a very good analogy, there are people that do catch the significance, but most people are caught up in trivial stuff. There's a guy, I think I've mentioned this before, but one of the most fascinating book titles, I think, ever. Go look it up and read it. There's a, a man named Neil Postman who wrote a book in, I believe it was in the 70s, and here's the title of the book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. It's about American culture. We're guilty of amusing ourselves to death. We get caught up in all this trivial stuff that really has nothing to do with anything and all the while, there could be something really important, like right here, that's taking place, and we're oblivious to it because we're so caught up in entertainment. I think we need to be really careful about that. I'm not against entertainment. You know, tonight, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do tonight when I go home. I didn't get to watch the Dallas Cowboy game today because I had some meetings and the other stuff going on. But I, I record them all. And guess what? The miracle of this is I know what the score was, and I'm going to love watching this game. This is going to be a fun one because they killed the Falcons today. If you didn't know it, sorry, I'm hate to, but they stomped them in the ground. It's going to be fun when you know there's another point there. When you know what happens in the end, no matter how bad it looks at first, I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to enjoy watching this. But it's just a football game. It doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. God doesn't mind that we have fun, but we need to keep things in perspective. And so, to Scott's point, yes, everybody was caught up in trivialities, but what about this? Tell me what this is a picture of, Scott. Exactly. This is that centurion, that Roman soldier. There was this one. He was probably involved in all this stuff before, but something happened with him during the course, kind of like the thief. Remember, both of them were heaping abuse on Jesus, and one of them, something happened in the course of it when he was observing Jesus and how Jesus was so composed and seemed to know something they didn't know, and it had an effect on him. And it has a profound effect on this person. In fact, in Mark's gospel, look in Mark's gospel. Turn to chapter 15 of Mark's gospel. His is the only one that, that says it like this. The other, you know, the gospels are different. They record things in different ways because they have different purposes for writing. And they see things from different angles and so forth. But Mark chapter 15 verse 39 says this. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus on the cross saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Jesus had a profound impact on him. He knew, man, we made a big mistake here. When he saw, it says when he saw how Jesus died. Remember the point I made this morning? Live like Jesus died. He saw the... He saw the incredible composure and grace and love of Jesus no matter what people did to him. And it had a profound impact even on this hardened Roman soldier. Now whether he actually went and bowed down at the cross, I don't know. He might have. But 
it did have an impact on him. And this is important to Scott's point. Uh, there's a lot of hedonism in our country, but there are people who are serious and go are going to take the message that we're trying to teach seriously. There are people out there like that. And the crowd may seem like they're all against you, but in any audience, there are some people who are serious and they're listening to what you say. I've experienced that personally myself at other times in the past. The majority might be against you, mocking you and ridicule ridiculing you, but at another time, maybe when that event is over, somebody might come up to you and say, you know, what you said really, really helped to, to get me thinking. So let me ask you a question. Okay, here's this soldier that Jesus obviously had a profound influence on this soldier, how Jesus conducted himself. Can you think of any other people in this story of Jesus' crucifixion? Can you think of any other people that Jesus had a profound influence on? Obviously, they were changed by him. Anybody? Who? Joseph of Arimathea? Yeah. He's one of the leaders of the, the Jewish people. And eventually, you know, he goes. He's the one who asks for the body of Jesus to help prepare it in a, in a loving, kind way. Obviously, Joseph. Who else? David? Who? Nicodemus. Okay, Nicodemus, another one who uh, uh, made a grave av available for Jesus. Okay, does somebody else over here raise their hand? Judas? How, tell me about Judas. What do you mean by Judas? Yeah. Now, what his ultimate fate is, I'm not sure. By reading the New Testament, it doesn't sound real good, but obviously he was convicted at least in some kind of a way. Okay. How about... Pardon me? Peter. Def definitely Peter. Because after he had uh, denied Jesus, he went out and wept bitterly. And obviously, when you read the book of Acts, man, he's completely different in the book of Acts. Peter in the book of Acts, who was so cowering in, in the Gospels and didn't want, you know, didn't want to be... In the book of Acts, you cannot shut that man up. They'll say, well, we'll beat you. We'll throw you in prison. I don't care. You do whatever you want. I know what I saw, and I, you will not shut me up. And he completely changed. Yeah. I think another one that's obvious we've already talked about, the thief on the cross, one of them was radically changed by, by what he witnessed with Jesus pretty plainly. Yeah, I bet he did say that. Yeah, I bet he did. One more that I think of. Can anybody think of anybody else before I mention one more? All Y'all mentioned some others I hadn't thought of, but those are all good. Anybody else during this episode that Jesus obviously had an impact on? Yeah. Yeah. I bet some of those people there when it got dark at noontime, I bet all of a sudden they went, uh oh. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's a pretty good analogy for what's going to happen one day in sti our future still. When Jesus comes back a second time, there's going to be a lot of people going, oh no, it was true. That should motivate us for evangelism. But one more person that I think of is Pilate. You know, Pilate, the Bible says there's a verse in Mark chapter 15, verse 5, and here's what it says. When Jesus was so composed, they're putting him through these trials. He's going to be executed, and Jesus stands there and doesn't say a word. The Bible says in Mark 15, verse 5, that Pilate was amazed. Jesus had an influence on Pilate. Now, not enough of an influence for him to act out of his convictions. He went along with what the crowd wanted him to do, but he made a, a difference in his thinking. And all of this just reminds me, it reminds me of this little phrase. The way to make a difference is the way of Christ. You want to know how to make a difference in the world? It's the way of Christ. Non-violent resistance. Live like Jesus died. Once again, that's what we talked about this morning. This is what we've been called to. This is what Jesus is asking us to do. When we walk out of here, he's saying, here's what I want you to do. You saw how I conducted myself on the cross, right? That's how I want you to live. And when you do that, it will make a tremendous difference in this world with the people that we come into contact with.
previous slide? This one? I'm, I did it too fast, didn't I? Okay. So as we leave, live like Jesus died. And it makes a difference even when we can't see it. We may not know in this life, but there's no telling what kind of impact it's having on people's lives. Okay, Clay's going to lead us in a song of invitation. If we can pray for you, counsel with you, help you in any kind of way, uh, allow us to do that. Let's all stand together while he leads us in this song. <laughs>